Hey, how's it going? Believe it or not, I like to just play Pokemon. I like turtles. There's a lot of times where I'll just sit down and play a run that might not come out for months. And Cloyster is a run that I've been messing around with since mid-April when it first started getting more heavily requested. And I would just like to take this time just real quick, not even talking about Cloyster, but I have this and a Persian run planned for you next week. And I've been working on them since about April 15th or so. The Mew video came out April 5th. And let me just ask you guys, what are the odds that a huge, working on 300,000 subscriber channel like J-Rose would release the exact same two videos back to back while I'm working on them in April? Of course, this isn't, this is the summertime now, but at the time I was just like, what's happening here? But anyways, that's beside the point. Cloyster is gonna be a very good run. Uh, this is one of those few times, I'm not even using a script right now. I'm just kind of talking off the top. Top. And I had to redo this one because initially I was kind of harsh on Cloyster and I ended up doing like several runs with it and really refining it I had a really good time with it and it's not gonna beat Mewtwo guys Nothing's gonna beat Mewtwo So please never say that this Pokemon can beat Mewtwo because it's not true Just stop embarrassing yourself But before we begin I would like to say that I do Pokemon solo run content fairly often And if that is of interest to you just consider subscribing What's it really cost you? It's one second Likes and comments also help out with that YouTube algorithm and we've broken into it once before and I believe we can get right back in it again. So if you are someone who just never interacts, never comments, never really thinks about it, just for me, just this once, scroll down and just type in Tanky Clam because Cloyster has about 18,000 defense and it'll just help everybody out. Everybody wins. It's that easy. And with that out of the way, sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop or a water because I had someone say they shouldn't be drinking soda pop so you can have water if you want. And let's just dive in and see what Cloyster can do at its maximum peak potential. Like with all my runs, I make sure our little clam has perfect DVs, and for this run, I'm going to be using the name Broodwitch because I like using references from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. That came out in 2003. I choose this name because Cloyster's back sprout is kind of weird, to say the least. It looks like some sort of weird sandwich, and the spiky horn type things on the top look like the Broodwitch from the episode I'm talking about. And I'm also given the rival Bulbasaur today because late game Razor Leaf easily provides the biggest threat. The start of the game is very simple. Cloyster starts off with some solid moves, but more importantly, it's pretty much tailor-made to crush Brock. The best course of action here is to fight only the mandatory bug catcher and instantly head to Brock. Clamp is the play here. It's one of those rap type moves, but it has a pretty impressive 35 base power, but the drawback is that it has a pretty abysmal 75% accuracy. It'll always hit twice, so it does more damage due to the Pokemon being double weak to it. Using Aurora Beam is not an option because it can't one-shot the two Pokemon and you need all that extra PP to get through the next segment. It's a very easy battle and only takes about 8 or so minutes of in-game time, but this is as easy as it's going to get for Cloyster. During the next segment, you'll see that being in the slow leveling group means that you just can't simply hit that hard on all the bug catchers. It can take multiple moves to get through them, but you really can't afford to do any extra battles here since you only have 30 or so points of PP to work with, and you want them to last all the way to Cerulean. Inside of Mount Moon, your first instinct would be to pick up Water Gun for the extra PP, but one of the biggest time saves I had during my runs was just simply not to waste the time. It seems like a pretty short walk to get it, but since you don't have access to repels yet, this part can easily add a minute or two to the final time. Now let's get to some of the nitty gritty parts of the run. Inside of Cerulean, the next huge optimization I made was heading to Misty first. And you might think this fight is awful at level 14, and you're exactly right. Supersonic comes in key, but its lower accuracy can be frustrating. On the first attempt, I missed something like 5 out of 6 times and I just rage reset at that point. To cut a long story short, this one takes a pretty good amount of luck. Staryu doesn't matter, and it's the star me that gives you the trouble. The good thing is Misty's good AI will make her only go for tackles during this. The strategy is very simple. I set up some withdrawals on the Staryu to mitigate the damage and from there you need Starmie to not crit every turn. And you need Supersonic to hit, have it hurt itself, and then just slowly chip it down with Aurora Beam. It sounds like it's simple in theory, but it really does take quite a long time. There's a lot of close calls, but since I don't take real life time into account for my metrics, it's not a big deal. 
Eventually you will get through healthy enough to get a little luck to get past this one. It's early in the video but honestly this is one of the hardest fights in the entire game and it's pretty impressive that Cloyster did it going to the fight only at level 14 so maybe that bodes well for the run. The critical part of this fight and the reason why I kept messing around with the order and I finally went with Misty as soon as I get to Cerulean is you get access to Bubble Beam. Clamp is just so unreliable at best and getting Bubble Beam and now having access to 265 base power stab moves with 20 power points each allows the route to Bill's house to be much faster in comparison if you did something like pick up water gun early and then go through all that before Misty. This is one of the biggest changes I made from my earlier prototype runs and it pays dividends moving ahead. After that it's time for rival number two. This fight is nothing compared to Misty and there's not much in-depth commentary here. Having a super effective answer for Pidgeotto is always a plus and even though I get low, I keep moving on, I get through the fight. The build segment is honestly boring but it does give us some much needed levels to catch up and now we can just zoom ahead to the SSN and it's really unfortunate that Cloyster can't get body slammed because it would help out a good bit but I do pick up the rare candy guarded by the gentleman with the fire types. It's fast and it's easy but after doing so many runs I needed to cut time and I figured dropping one of the 11 rare candies was another way to. I decided this would be faster than getting the optional rare candy inside of Victory Road way later but I do have to admit that I didn't and scientifically test it and I'm just kind of going off a of feel for that. Either way, rival number three is next. It's about the same as last time, but I'm a decent amount stronger now. You can immediately see where Body Slam on Kadabra would have helped out, and Kadabra combined with Ivysaur do get us fairly low, but it's just not enough to prevent a first turn victory. But let's take a look ahead at some of the more run defining moments. But first guys, we get blessed. It's Tombstoner Tom on this run. Everybody say hi to Tombstoner Tom in the comments, please. With that said, any run that's going to compete and be at the top cannot be doing any backtrack if Cloyster wants to be elite, it needs to take down Lieutenant Surge right now. This fight is about on the same level as Misty, and it's in contention for the worst part of the run, but there are some positives here. Voltorb isn't bad at all, and although Pikachu survives in this clip, it is a range. You can more often than not just one-shot it, but if it does survive and gets off a Thunder Wave, it's basically your, this attempt over, you have to reset. As you might have guessed, it's Raichu that's the issue. Cloyster does not have Elite Special, and a Thunderbolt will basically faint you even if you are missing any HP like from a Voltorb Sonic Boom. Out of all of my runs, this is the reason that you need to hang on to Supersonic for this long. Because when you're first doing a Cloyster run, the conventional logic would tell you to replace it for more PP, maybe with like Water Gun that we skipped earlier, but you absolutely need it here to make this battle not 100% luck based where you only have like a 0.5% chance to get past here. With that said, I still die a ton here, but just like with Misty, I'd like to reiterate that I don't use real life time as a metric, so it doesn't matter if it takes me 13 years to get past this one. Eventually, I get past, and it looks really bad. I take a Thunderbolt, I go all the way down to 3 HP, but I get off a Supersonic. Raichu hurts itself twice, and then some Bubble Beams add up to finally get past this one. This is a huge test, and on some other runs, I did things like pick up extra battles so that I could be a higher level, but honestly, it just didn't help that much. Being able to do it without the extra battles goes a very long way in the success of this run, but let's keep it moving. Even without coverage moves, Rock Tunnel is very easy, it's very boring, so let's cut ahead to Celadon as we inch closer to that mid game. The first huge optimization I made here is that you'll notice that I skipped the Poke Center for now. Out of the multiple runs, there's really nothing absolutely necessary that will save us a ton of time but we will come back to this later, so let's hold off talking about it until then. From there, I quickly tackle the rocket hideout, and there are some key changes I refined in this very last run. The first is that I pick up an optional battle and I pick up double edge. I'm not always a fan of recoil damage, but I use tri-attack in all of the other runs except for this one, and this change is pretty significant, but we're not going to see it until way later. Outside of that, I will bring up something that I've been doing in my runs that I've touched on in the last couple of videos, but let's do it once again. Normally in this segment and the Pokemon Tower segment, I do just zoom through them as fast as possible. I've realized that I can waste just a tiny amount of time and pick up the high money items like nuggets, HP ups, and other vitamins to ultimately sell for other vitamins later in the game. I do make a mistake here. I forget that there's a 
hidden nugget near double edge but that's all right you can get about 15,000 pokey dollars here and the same goes for pokemon tower literally if you just take like 10 seconds of time you can get a decent chunk of money and it's really helped me shave off some time in my runs outside of that i've been telling myself that i'm going to streamline a bit more of the boring parts of the runs and while i'm showing a snippet of giovanni number one and not completely cutting it out just know that it's about as easy as you can imagine i don't even heal here and it's a one shot i will show rival number four and it seems kind of counterintuitive to what i just said but i'm showing it because i teach double edge for this fight specifically for the Gyarados. Aurora Beam is neutral damage and it's just not the strongest move. And I know some of you are doubting not going to the Celadon Mart for better moves, but guys, you have to trust me here. It is important to note that Double Edge's base 100 power does give me about a 25% damage boost over Tri-Attack. And what some of you might not know is that Generation 1 Tri-Attack doesn't have any secondary effects. It's basically just an 80 power base move and it wasn't until generation 2 where it started to get that 20% chance to either burn, freeze, or paralyze the target. It doesn't exist in generation 1. Anyways, this battle is fast and easy like you would expect, but I did want to talk about double edge and try attack for a second. Now skipping ahead towards Fuchsia, the next very tiny time save I did here was skipping the hidden max elixir on cycling road. It really was just a few seconds. But it's not really as insignificant as you might think. I dip into the Safari Zone next, and just like I mentioned earlier, this is another location where you can stack up on some easy money, with some very easy to get vitamins found on the same path that you'd be getting the last HMs of the run anyway. Afterwards, I dig back to Celadon, and this is where you finally go to the Pokemart. Selling all the items that I've been picking up gets me over 60,000 Poke Dollars, this allows me to pick up 6 calciums to give me a boost in special. Since Cloyster's slow leveling group means that I'm just going to be lower level for the entire run. You might notice that I buy just a single fresh water for the guard and that's it. I will not be using Ice Beam for this run and that might just seem crazy to some of you. But once again, I'm going to ask you guys to trust in the process as we keep progressing forward. From there, I go back to Koga and I actually lose the first attempt. I waste too many early turns trying to set up withdrawal and the Weezing gets off a critical hit sludge which honestly does a pretty impressive amount of damage considering what Cloyster's base defense stat is. I'm not going to get too in depth to Koga because it's not too interesting but the second attempt is about the same. I actually run out of surf PP near the end but Cloyster miraculously hangs on with 1 HP and a dream and it does end up taking the battle. This is an important fight because these main battles are starting to have a a big level advantage over us since Cloyster doesn't have elite speed getting the speed portion of the badge boost is very critical for this run and even though doing this battle at a 10 level disadvantage wasn't the most consistent thing two tries is not too bad I'll take it since Cloyster will be using surf for this run it's prime time to take a very, very brisk swim down to Cinnabar, and we're just going to clear our heads a little bit here, guys. The very key part here, I feel like I've been saying that a lot, but it's Blizzard. A Stab Blizzard is absurdly powerful, and I'll be able to use all of my PP ups on it, get it up to 8 uses. I will say it's always annoying being here at lower levels because repels only work up to your level, so I'm still getting a bunch of encounters inside of the Pokemon Mansion. But that's neither here nor there. And you guys might be expecting me to talk about a certain TM28. But after digging out of the mansion, I was back in Celadon anyway. And I thought, why not go ahead and pick up Erica since I had skipped her earlier since Razor Leaf was scary. Honestly, this fight is about what you'd expect. I now have Blizzard and all of her Pokemon are weak to it. It's uh, one of those battles where it's three moves, three Pokemon down, give me my badge. And that's really about all there is to say about it. Now finally, we can go back to Cinnabar. And after no optional battles and some Tombstoner, brother, I can tackle Blaine. On paper, this fight is very simple. Withdraw for some speed badge boost to ensure that you can outspeed the Rapid Dash. And with a stab serve, you can pretty much slice through the team. In practice, it works seemingly perfect, but at the end of the fight, things are a little bit different. Fire Blast does extremely heavy neutral damage, and since I can't one-shot the thickest of boys in Arcanine, and I'm staring down an 11 level deficit, it just melts through me. I fail my first attempt, but I do think the strategy is still solid. There's no need for adjustments. I fail once again, but on the third attempt, I actually avoid any Fire Blast since Blaine has random AI. It uses a couple of embers, 
but they just aren't enough to finish me off. I hang on with just 14 HP, and two surfs are good enough to pick up our sixth badge of the game. Sylph Co is the last place to go, and outside of getting the rare candy on the 10th floor, it's just straight to business. This takes us to rival number five, and let's just take a peek in and see how it goes. Pidgeot is first, it only has physical damage, so I do take this opportunity to set up just a little bit. Eventually Blizzard is enough to take it out in a single hit and we move on in the battle. Gyarados is next, and here I go for double edge. I do think that Blizzard probably was the play, I don't know if it could have one shot it, but either way it's still a two turn victory. Next up is Growlithe, and you know what a surf is going to do here, there's no need to talk about this. Alakazam then comes in, and we have access to double edge, Tri Attack could have still gotten the job done here if you're one of those people who want to do your own playthrough and you're kind of stubborn about trying different things and finally last up is Venusaur and the best commentary I can really give you guys is that Blizzard is super effective and it has stab it's a one-shot victory and honestly it was fairly easy and that's always good I'd say if you were doing real life time you might want to come here earlier because it seems like this would be much more consistent than Koga or Blaine but since I can just reset without actually hurting the run I really like my pathing in this attempt better than all the other runs that I did. I'm going to be skipping Giovanni number 2 in this run and let's take a look at Sabrina. This fight isn't too bad since we held off and already did everything else we can do up to this point but Double Edge can one hit the Kadabra and there's just no reason to set up and you don't want it to get off any moves. The Mr. Mime is where you want to set up since it's fairly weak. From there you'll have access to the boost required to just cruise through to the end of the fight and more importantly, you can just one-shot the Alakazam. Very easy. Looking ahead at Giovanni, I show him just because he is the 8th gym leader, but don't expect anything challenging here. Every member of his team is weak to Blizzard, and multiple of his Pokemon are double weak to Surf. It's one of the easiest fights in the entire run, and there's no need to waste too much time looking into this. There's more important things to look at. Before I head towards the Elite Four, I do finally pick up Strength and the Rare Candy located there. I only bring this up because I completely ruined another run by forgetting to pick up Strength and not realizing it until I was already in Victory Road. So this is more or less just a self reminder if anything else. I forget to give the Gold Teeth to the Warden more times than I would probably care to admit. Now we are on to the final challenges of the run and let's just get that rival music queued up and hop right in. This fight is very similar to the fight we just watched, but this one's always a good test. On the Pidgeot, I don't set up. I looked at my experience before the fight and I should level up later so there's no point in doing anything now. All that's required here is a single blizzard so let's not waste any more time. Rhyhorn is up next, it's double weak to serve so you just know the outcome already but the important thing is that this is where we level up to 43. Here on the Gyarados I, I just make a huge mistake, I try to set up. And while Cloyster has the top defense in the entire game, it has a pretty pathetic HP stat, so Dragon Rages just quickly add up. Before I can realize my blunder, I just get taken out and that's a reset. So let's jump right back into Gyarados on the attempt number two. I really just don't learn my lesson here. I still go to set up at first, and it's fine because all it's doing is using some leers to help me out, but I just keep pressing my luck. Eventually it does start going for Dragon Rages again. I sort of fumble my way through this fight. Eventually I do miss a blizzard and then when a single blizzard fails to one shot it, I end up making it out of this part of the fight in red health. Growlithe is insignificant so there's really not much to say but when it comes to the Alakazam, the huge problem right now is recoil damage. It's high special means that I'm just not going to be able to one shot it so I go for the suicidal double edge and that's yet another reset. And on the third attempt, what it really comes down to is that, can I get lucky or stop getting unlucky I guess depending on your perspective. I don't take a ton of damage here like the previous attempts, it just goes for some leers and some bites mostly and I'm able to get through this part much more healthy than the previous attempts. From there, I have enough HP in reserve to where the recoil damage is insignificant and Alakazam is just a one shot. And with all those boosts I got while I'm Gyarados, that means that Blizzard is also in prime position for a one shot on the Venusaur. And if I had to play this fight over, I could just go straight damage on the Gyarados and then set up on the Growlithe to make things a little more consistent, but three tries really isn't that bad. But that leaves us looking ahead at the Elite Four. My biggest worry about Cloyster when I started researching it was the lack of coverage moves. But we are on a very good pace, 
and this is the refined run after several other attempts so let's see how strong this sandwich can finish up the game. I do skip the rare candy inside of Victory Road and like usual I use all but a few of my other rare candies but I did make a slight adjustment to use them before Victory Road so that I don't get any extra encounters that make it through the repels being at such a low level. And with that said, let's take a look at Lorelei. This one was a fight I didn't think Cloyster would do very well at, and at a level deficit, I wasn't sure how this one would go. On the Dugong, you kind of start to get an idea. Since I'm Water and Ice type, it'll use Takedown, Growl, or Rest. Since I'm freshly leveled up, I want to set up here and that's what I do. There's really no threat of dying, but if you were just giving it lots of free turns while you use Withdrawal, it's inevitable that it's going to use Growl at least once. This means that if you thought maybe you were going to use a double edge for neutral damage to get through this fight, it's just not going to happen. The really good part about all these boosts is that even though Surf is resisted, it actually starts to do some really solid damage and you can eventually easily get past this part. Now we have the mirror match. Surf does really good damage, but I do crit here, so I actually do less damage. But I don't think Surf would have been a one shot anyway, so it was going to be a two shot regardless, so we could just quickly go to the next Pokemon. Next up is Slowbro, and some people might think that Mimic would be decent, not necessarily for this part, but for the run in general. And I'll address that real quick. It's a waste of time. Picking up the Pokedog, going to the girl's house, going into the menu, learning it, replacing a new move, it just all equates to wasting your time. I wouldn't use Mimic for Cloyster, but that's just my opinion. Anyway, Slowbro isn't too bad. Jinx doesn't resist water, so Surf is just an easy one and done here. And now we can look at another tanky boy. This fight isn't quick at all, and it's actually pretty annoying. Being confused and the paralysis from Body Slam can really stretch this one out. Boosts go a long way to make sure you actually do respectable damage, and with a little persistence and just kind of hoping you don't get too unlucky means that this one's not bad at all. Overall, Lorelai was much easier than I initially thought it would be, and although you don't have coverage, she doesn't either, and it was very consistent throughout all of my runs. I did have to reset because I had a full inventory and I didn't realize it. I thought I bought full restores, but I didn't, so I had to do Lorelai over again. So there might be some health discrepancies going straight to Bruno, and the fact that I just went straight here kind of sets up how I feel about Bruno, and you guys know what to expect here. I do actually set up just a little bit to make sure things go smooth and from there I just kind of unleash on his little weak and pathetic team. Machamp can actually survive an attack but overall it's just very easy let's keep going. Next up is Agatha and you really don't have any great ways to deal with her Pokemon outside of neutral damage. The first Gengar presents the same familiar problems, status conditions can make things tough but it never really hits me with them in this attempt. It's annoying that Blizzard is just outside of the range of a two shot and that would make things much more consistent but here I'm able just to get through with some decent luck and we don't nothing really happens to us. We do have Blizzard for Golbat but I do go for a couple of setup turns here. Thankfully there's no hazes being tossed out and I do avoid confusion damage and eventually I take it out in one hit and I get a couple of boosts to hopefully help smooth out the rest of this fight. Haunter is next. And here is what you kind of expect from the worst case scenario from an Agatha battle. I'm already confused, I hurt myself, then I get put to sleep, and I never get to wake up. Nightshade does very well against our poor HP stat, and Dream Eater does heavy damage as well. This one is a reset, and let's just jump into the next attempt. So in this attempt, I get confused, and I just go straight for serve only. I'm guessing it was to save some PP, but either way I do get confused, I fight through it, and the second surf actually crits to make this actually faster than the first attempt. I'm skipping over the Golbat straight into the Haunter, it starts out the same way, I'm already confused, I hurt myself, but this time I don't get put to sleep, Blizzard does really heavy damage, and since Agatha hits no status conditions this time, it's not too bad. Our bot comes in, it's not an issue. One boosted blizzard can take care of this snaky little boy. The last Gengar is next, and since it doesn't have hypnosis, our chances are much better. I do get confused, and I'm worried about a Nightshade ultimately finishing me off, but the boost I got on Golbat means that blizzard is actually a two shot, and after a few turns, I'm able to finish off the fight. And Agatha's kind of what you would expect. If you get put to sleep, then the usual problems come into play, but overall, it's far from the worst Agatha run I've ever had, so let's just look ahead at Lance. This fight really doesn't look too bad on paper, unless 
something happens, like maybe Gyarados turn one Hyper Beam crits you for massive damage, just like what happens here. I try to set up a little bit since I know I can't one shot it anyway, but after ultimately taking a Dragon Rage a couple of turns later, and I finally take it out, I'm sitting here at 12 HP, meaning that if I don't one shot everything, this one's over with, it's a reset for sure. I did set up, and with my typing and the stab moves I got, this one shouldn't be too bad. This means that the blizzards can just absolutely melt through the two Dragonairs, and with the boost I do outspeed the Aerodactyl and I can finish it off with a single surf. It's all pretty standard stuff, it's not too interesting, and at the end of the day, all it comes down to is if we outspeed the Dragonite and hit a first turn blizzard, and that's exactly what happens. Despite a disastrous start and going all the way down to 12 HP, Cloyster shows a lot of resiliency in this fight and that's always good. And now we're down to the final showdown. Cloyster has looked very strong outside of some bad luck on an Agatha attempt, but let's see how this clam finishes off the run. First up is Pidgeot. It has all physical moves and we have a stupidly high defense, so you already know that this is setup time. I finish off with all the withdrawals and then a blizzard can move us on. Alakazam is next. And guys, this is the one solitary reason that you really want double edge for this run. Unfortunately, I do think it's a range to one shot even with six boost, but I do think an extra protein or two could make it 100% consistent, but I just crit here so it's not an issue. It's important to note that Tri-Attack cannot one shot Alakazam at this level and it can also one shot you back. At this point, I pretty much talked over Rhydon, but Surf, it's double weak, moving on. Now it's time for Gyarados, and it's still a menace. Blizzard cannot one-shot it even through the boost, but all it does on its turn is go for a Leer, and I can finish it off after. The Thickest of Boys is up next, and Surf is enough here to be a one and done, and that's what we like to see. Venusaur is up next, and since I just leveled up, Blizzard unfortunately is not a one-shot. Razor Leaf would be a death sentence, but instead it charges up a solar beam and I can finish off with a disrespectful surf to take the fight. And Cloyster has done it. I got a few closing thoughts on this run, but like I said, I did a lot of practice and refining on this run to make it as good as what we got to see. But let's just take a look at the stats before I go any further. Cloyster finishes with a level of 57, but more importantly, I was able to squeeze out a 2 hour and 38 minute run with this little clam. Obviously that ties it with Nidal King for the number 2 slot, and that's a great run, but it comes with a huge caveat, at least from my point of view. You see with some other runs, specifically Nidal King, it didn't get multiple runs of refinement. I practiced the Brock segment a little bit, and then I just sort of winged it, and I let the time stand since it was number 1 at the time. And although Cloyster was very impressive, do you guys not think that if I did, let's say, uh, three more full Nidal King runs and I fully optimized it, that I wouldn't be able to save a single minute? I'd be willing to bet that I might be able to save like five minutes. And for that reason, I have to put Cloyster in the third slot. This all kind of has me thinking about how my view has changed on redoing runs. Last year, I was kind of against it. I would do it on rare occasions, but as time goes on, I think if you want things to be really accurate and you really and honestly want to get the best run possible and see how everything stacks up, it's pretty necessary. I think in the future, I'm going to take some extra off camera time to redo several of my runs and maybe I'll make a video about some of the refinements and the new times that they improved on. This mainly applies for Pokemon at the top. We're talking about Mewtwo, Alakazam, Nidoking, maybe Machamp, Snorlax even. Ghastly, Gengar, stuff like that, I think they could all be improved with all the stuff I've learned over this past year, but I'll see how I feel about playing that much extra Pokemon. Either way, I'm man enough to admit that I was kind of wrong about Cloyster. I didn't think it would be this good. It did take a lot of runs and pretty much perfect optimization, but it was able to tie itself way up there with Nidoking, King, at least for now. Looking ahead, there are still a lot of requests you guys have asked for. I still have like 5 Kangaskhan requests, I got several Jinx requests, but Persian is the video for next week. Bingus always needs his floppa. And if you made it this far, I just have to say real quick, and I'll probably repeat this on the next video, what are the odds that J-Rose would do 2 videos in a week and 
those two videos be the exact two projects that I've been working on slowly since about mid-April. It's a little improbable, but that's probably it's probably just a strange coincidence. Or at least that's what my girlfriend told me. J Rose, are you listening right now, buddy? I'm joking, all jokes aside, but that's about all I got for you. I'd like to give a special shout out to Not Gaming, the person that requested this run about a million times, and if you haven't already done it multiple times. Please stop replying to random comments and just leave your own. I can't stress enough how much harder it is to see your comments when I don't get a notification for it. But I digress. Not gaming. Leave your own comments. The rest of you, have a great end to your week. And I guess I'll catch you guys on the next video. Bye.